Ariel, Andy McKay here with Claims Delegates. It's in here at OAJ Airport, Jacksonville, Albert Ellis. On the way home, so I thought I'd do an intro for the podcast just about to come out and uh, let you know that uh, there are other people struggling with exactly what you're struggling right now. Uh, folks down in uh, Dallas, Texas, Rainy Day Services, they've been paid on in full on 50% of their jobs they've done this year, which is just not a good number, right? They've, they've not been paid on 30%, fully 30% of their jobs they haven't received a dime. So that's something we talk about, something we talk about potential solutions. And if you've got something that works for you, let us know. Send us an email. Send us a message here on this video. Whatever it takes, uh, let's come together. Let's, let's figure this thing out. All right, see you. How are you guys? What part of the country are you guys in? So we're just north of Dallas, Texas. Okay. A little town called Anna. So in Collin County. So Anna. You guys have been getting killed with storms. Yes. Yeah. Back in February, tons of ice and then several hail storms. And just they hadn't stopped raining in about a month. So yeah, that, that hail storm was something else. I saw some of those pictures. Yeah. Yeah, it's been pretty crazy. What part of town are you in? Are you in Arizona? I don't remember. I'm in uh, Bend, Oregon. Oregon, okay. Yeah, so all the way on the left coast. Yeah. So nice. Uh, just to set it up, I wanted to get to know folks across the country, and I felt I, I'm a big believer in you and I are probably not dealing with unique problems, right? We've, we've got problems that we share across the industry, so let's let everyone know. Let's let everyone in on um, the, the learning, as it yeah. were, the knowledge sharing, and uh, and hopefully you guys are good with that. So. Yeah, no, that's great. I appreciate the opportunity to ask your, ask some questions of me and get some advice and yeah. swap war stories and all that kind of stuff. Good deal. Well, I've got uh, I've got a couple. I've got a Matterport up uh, behind here, and I've got the Xactimate estimate of that Matterport. If if we want to go down that road, but let's talk about mitigation. You. You had some questions about getting paid. Let's let's first off say how much. What's your guys's volume? What's uh, what kind of volume you guys doing? Uh, so this year we did what eighty. I think we've done about eighty projects so far, yeah. mitigation wise. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And that's uh, most of them have been huge demos. I mean, we're talking big. You know, not just a little bathroom, but kitchens, bathroom, you know, half the house, all that kind of stuff. Is that is that unique to this year from the ice storm or is that from what you guys are used to doing? Yeah, you, usually what are we doing? About eight a month, something like that. Eight, probably eight to ten a month. Okay, yeah. okay. It's not a regular year. This year, yeah, we just, you know, the phone rang as soon as the freeze came and it never stopped. No. So we just scrambled and and uh tried doing what we've been doing and and it wasn't working very well and so we started doing new things and um <laughs> paperwork wise you know and and then now that we're on the tail end of it and projects are wrapping up and we're you know getting money and trying to get the rest of it it's like well some of these things that we try to do aren't working right and so right. you know there's some frustration there so so what percentage, what percentage of job, open jobs, or uh, what percentage of the jobs that you did have you not been paid for yet? Um, so there, we've got some that are still wrapping up, but I'd say we've gotten money, at least some money on probably 70% of our projects. There, there's a few that we just haven't received anything at all yet. Um, and I don't know if it's just the insurance company dragging their feet or what, you know, but uh, things are still in review and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, but, but most of, most of the jobs we've gotten some. Yeah. Hold on. I'm going to mute so I can lower this without making a bunch of noise here. Right now we can talk about them. I don't know. Are we muted too? No. It's like that uh, Steve Martin show where he goes into the soundproof booth. <laughs> so far. <laughs> that's what he was doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's what you're really doing. <laughs> exactly. Oh. He's like, thanks. You just recorded this on my YouTube channel. 
<laughs> You're welcome. We should stream it. We should stream yeah, it. That's, that's right. It. Spilt my drink. It's all right. So uh, anything that hasn't been paid, have you invoiced, have you, have you invoiced your client or sent something off to the insurance company on that 30% that's, that's unpaid? Yeah, everybody has been sent something. Okay. And yeah, everybody has been sent. I mean, there's, I think, two that I haven't invoiced out yet, but pretty much everybody has been invoiced. Um, I've got several that are, you know, the adjuster will email and say, hey, I've got your, your estimate, which I like that, but I've got your paperwork and uh, everything looks great except these 19 things. And here's my comparative. And, you know, I know you're billing 20,000, but we're going to give you 1,200. You know, right. and, and so I, I've got several of those people that we're dealing with now. And um, but for the most part, everybody, everybody's been invoiced. They've received paperwork and we've gotten something from probably about 70 percent. OK. All right. Uh, how much of that? How much of that volume did you do that you were paid 100 percent on? So out of everything and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we've probably. Sure. Yeah. I, I would think about half of our jobs, we've been paid 100% on everything. Okay. Oh, well, that's not going to help me right now. So uh, when I see or when I hear problems of getting paid on mitigation, uh, I know there's, there's several common things. So I'm just going to ask you guys if you have these things in place or if not, uh, and then we'll go down the list of things that I think uh, should be done, and then uh, yeah, potential landmines. You, know, you guys are not alone. Uh, frankly, 30% unpaid is a good number compared to your peers in the Texas market right now. Uh, there are there are guys uh, that are doing work in Texas for the freeze that haven't been paid a dime on any of the work they've done, uh, and and that's a large to a large degree. It's because the insurance companies got caught flat-footed. Yeah. Then we, in turn, as an industry, got caught flat-footed, and I, they're still not caught up. They they just no one had any idea that overnight you could get five and a half million claims. Uh, Is that how many claims they finally? Yeah, I, my number is, is five five point two five to five point five million. Um. Just in Texas or kind of this whole just, no, region? just in Texas. Wow. Just in Texas from the freeze, you know, not including anything that happened since. Yeah. Uh, and that's also not including the day that the daily claims didn't stop because yeah. of the freeze. Uh, what I'm seeing, the, the industry is reeling right now. Um, we've got, I'm working a bunch of appraisals in North Carolina right now from Hurricane Florence, which was 2018. Um, and there's an insurance company there that they sent all their open claims to appraisal the, the insurance company instigated appraisal on all their open claims within a week, which tells me that they are frightened. They're scared. They are panicked, uh, and they're severely undercapitalized. Now that's not the case in my opinion for the major carriers that you guys are dealing with. Um, most of them have good capitalization and good reinsurance in place. Uh, but for the most part, they just don't want to pay. Yeah. And, and what we've done as an industry, sorry, I'm getting on a little soapbox here, but what we have done was we have allowed that we have allowed them to put us as restorers in a box. Um, and it started way back and it started 20 years ago, you know, maybe 2003, 2004, where somebody said, well, I can dry any house. I'll guarantee you I dry any house in three days. Well, guess what became the, the de facto standard? Well, guess what? You guys know better as, as well as I do. You can't dry any house in three days. You can dry some houses in three days. Um, but the physics determine how long it takes, not marketing, you know, not the adjuster. Um, so it's, and then someone said, well, I'm making plenty of money on mitts. I, I'm just going to, we don't need to charge 10 and 10 on MIT. And then what happened? No one can charge 10 and 10 on MIT, which is ridiculous because I was doing it. I, my, my first four years in this industry, it was 10 and 10 on everything. Roof, mitigation, repairs, it didn't matter. We're a contractor, we're charging 10 and 10. 
And in reality, 10 to 10 is not enough either. You know, who, who has overhead of 10%? Most people are 20%. Yeah. Um, yeah, in profit, you know, if, I, I, if I'm aiming for 10, 11% net, my gross has got to be 35, 40. But, you know, they don't, they don't think about those things. They don't care about those things. So, okay, do you guys have, as part of your contract package, a schedule of fees? No, no. And, I, and looking back over our issues, I think that's been our, you know, one of the things that we needed to change. And, and last week we did change the way that we're going to try it moving forward. But, but for this last, you know, season, we didn't have a schedule of fees. Yeah. And that's when you don't have an agreed price for what you're going to do up front, it, the de facto is Xactimate. And then once, once, you, once the carrier assumes Xactimate, they assume all this other layers of bullshit on top of Xactimate. They, they think you should use Xactimate in a very specific way on it really hamstrings you. There's a lot of guys out there and I'm not going to put you on the spot, but there's a lot of guys out there that written into their work authorization is essentially says we will accept payment for whatever the insurance company pays us. Or yeah, pay I was going to say that. Good. Because that also, that just screws you because the insurance company was going to get a hold of that contract and they're going to go, oh, well, well, we're going to pay you 50 cents on a dollar. And you just, you told the insured that you would accept 50 cents on a dollar because you, you know, that's what you said. Right. Uh, so schedule fees, a good, strong schedule of fees. You can develop that by looking at the water damage items and Xactimate and then building in your profitability and your overhead needs. So when you're talking schedule of fees, are you saying that you're doing an estimate of the job before you start, or you're just saying, Hey, if we do demo, it's, it's this price per whatever. And, and if we do drying, it's this price per whatever. Yeah. And you can use a hundred different ways to skin the cat. Yeah. But I take the most common items that you're going to use, air movers, axials, dehues of different size, uh, desiccants, maybe you just list out, okay, this is the equipment that we're probably going to use on your job. And this is what we charge per day. This is the labor we're probably going to use. You can use water damage labor, framing labor, demo labor. You can list those things out. And this is what our charge is per hour. So you don't have to estimate it up front. Mm -hmm. The guys in California have to. Unfortunately, California, you have to give a number. They can't, you can't, you can't have ask someone to sign a contract without a number attached. So California is weird. It's it's really hard to do work out there. But as long as you have, you know, signed by them, by the by your customer you have agreed to pay me $35 a day for every air mover I use. You can always go back to that schedule of fees when, when you get into these fights with the insurance company and say, hey, this is what our, my contract says. My contract says $35 a day for an air mover, $45 an hour for labor, and we will go back to Xactimate out of courtesy to you, but technically, according to our contract, this is what is owed. Uh, and that gives you a whole lot more leverage, especially since if your schedule of fees is properly built, it's all your, your final invoice is going to always going to be more than what you can get out of Xactimate. Uh, and right. then you can look, you can, you can give them a win, say, Hey, this should have been 20,000, but we put it in Xactimate and it's 15 due in 15 days. Uh, so, okay. Schedule of fees. That's, you've got to have that implemented. And then um, payment terms. When is this invoice due? Yes, it's due, it's due upon receipt because the work's already been done. But when does late fees, when do late fees start? And what is that percentage? Right. Yeah, and we've got that. So Good. And then when is, uh, you guys are in Texas, is what's, what's the, how long do you have to lean up property? I, th I, I need to look into it. We're not real good about doing liens and threatening liens and everything. I, I think it's 90 days, between 60 and 90 days after the, the invoice is finished. Um, but again, I we just have to look at it and see. Yeah, it's, I think it's 62 days in Oregon. So, uh, and you're required to have that lien, um, the, the, the notice of right to lien in your initial paperwork. Mm -hmm. you guys, are you guys doing that? No. 
No, and it, and in our, I mean, we're we're working straight off the the old way. Up until two weeks ago, we've been working straight off work authorization. That's you know the first party. Hey, we do this. Uh, we're going to submit an invoice as a courtesy, but you're still responsible personally for all the charges. Sure. And you know if we're not paid within 30 days, there's late fee, and you know kind of outlines those things. Um, okay. But it doesn't get specific into our you know prices. Or and it doesn't actually doesn't address liens either, but um, that's kind of what we're at right now. Yeah, well, that's that's why you're having this conversation, so yep. we can lead you down the right road. And there's the reality is we have to hold on to every bit of leverage we have as restorers, uh, because you know damned well the insurance company is going to hold on. They're going to hold their insured to the letter of the contract, which is the insurance policy. So what you have is, is your contract with your client and they have a contract with the insurance company. Uh, both those documents need to be dialed in and the insurance company is going to make sure that they're dialed in and their butts covered on the insurance and the, on the policy side, but you got to make sure your butts covered on your contract, your work authorization side. Yeah. Um, and that's re realistically, that's something that, that most restorers are really lazy about. Because up until recently, we didn't have to be this just, just hard nosed about it. We didn't have these kinds of problems 10 years ago. You know, we weren't, you know, having, having only 50% of your open jobs or close, you know, your finished jobs paid in full was, was unreal. I was like, why, how would you get yourself in that situation? It just didn't happen before mm -hmm. where now it is. And if you're not willing to take 50 cents on a dollar, that's how the insurance company is going to play the game. They're going to push it and push it and push it. The only thing we have is our contract with our client and the, the lien laws and, and late fees. You know, usually we don't see a lot of late fees getting collected, but you, you, you put them on and then you end up backing them off once you get the full payment. That's fine. If, if it takes adding $500 in late fees to get you paid in full, and then you got to take the late fees back. That's fine. It's a collection expense. Right. Uh, but there's also some guys out there that will, that will say, no, I'm not giving up my late fees. They did this, right? That, that costs money. I put labor and materials into this job and it's 90 days ago. I paid those bills already. So now I'm charging you interest because I've already, I've incurred those costs and I paid my people, I paid my subs, I paid the materials. Uh, and now you're going to pay me plus late fees. Uh, and I'm, I think they're fully justified, but that goes back to what your, what your client base, what is your, what percentage of jobs are you doing that are uh, program TPA based? Um, so we are on a list with travelers. I guess we got on like what, five years ago. Yeah. We thought we got kicked off a couple of times because we argue with them so much, but they still refer us. <laughs> yeah. They, they call it, but it's always a nightmare and they've never like stipulated. This is the price that, you know, you have to charge on a program because oh, yeah. the paper, you know, the paperwork just says to be a vendor, we expect you to give professional service and respond and, you know, do these things, do what you normally do, you know? So that's what we do. And we bill them exactly like we bill everybody else. But yeah, this year, the travelers adjusters have been brutal, just jerks. Yeah. It's been, oh, yeah. It's been crazy. So yeah, we're hoping to get kicked off the list or at least to voluntarily <laughs> remove ourselves because it's just not worth it, but we're not with like um, Code Blue or you know Contractor Connection or anything Contractor like that. Connection. Yeah. But so travelers didn't send a a claims package like mm -hmm. this. This is your this is how you estimate things package like no. Contractor Connection does. No, and this was like four years ago. So and really, I don't remember even getting like an official welcome. They're like, we got all your stuff, and then we started getting calls saying I was referred by travelers. So. I don't know that we're actually on their thing, except the, the adjusters have thrown at my face several times this year where they're like, you're an approved vendor. You shouldn't be charging O and P you shouldn't be charging this, you know? And I said, I never signed anything that I wouldn't charge this. You know, right. you might not like my percentages that I'm doing. Cause we're not, we're doing more than 10 and 10, but. Um, well, see, and I was told that we were taking off of it because a few years ago I got into a pissing match with them over a job where I had used a plumber to disconnect uh, kitchen sink and stuff like that. And 
they told me that it wasn't necessary. I said, well, if there's a secondary leak because of a leaky valve, you're going to want me to, and it leaks and causes damage, I'm going to be responsible. So I'm going to use a licensed plumber. So we got into a pissing match. And then, and then the next thing I heard was, well, I'm taking you off our preferred vendor list and blacklisting you. And we still get referrals from them. So I don't know. Maybe they got fired. So you, know. <laughs> you can hope. Yeah, I sleep fine. So yeah. yeah, exactly. And that's what it comes down to is, is we do good work. You know, I sleep great. My, my pillow is soft and I, I zonk out. I have, there's nothing back here going, who did I lie to today? Who did I pressure to do something wrong today? Or who do I steal from today? I don't have any of that. Uh, where there's some adjusters out there that probably don't sleep real well. Well, but that brings up the question and I think I'd email it to you, but so like, let's say we've got a deal where, you know, we're going off for work authorization and I don't want to mess up your flow. So you got your questions, but no, 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 this is, this is your, your time. Okay. So like we sent an invoice, I, it was like 12, $12,000, something like that. Right. And the adjuster, their first response to me was just complete, like anger. They were just completely angry at me. Right. Oh, yeah. And so they get, they get mad when you don't, you color in the line. Yeah. So that's, that's the way that we started. And then it just went nuclear from like the first email. And I could never get the homeowner on my side. Um, mm. And so she automatically assumes that, you know, we're overcharging, we're ripping them off, all this kind of stuff. So the insurance company said, look, we're only going to pay $9,200 or whatever. Right. So there's a, a almost a $3,000 shortage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, according to the agreement she signed, if they don't pay, you know, you're saying that you want to pay, that you're, that you're agreeing to pay. My issue is like, I'm coming at it saying, well, but you also didn't know how much it was gonna cost you when it was all done. And so is it really right for me to expect you to pay, you know, this huge number, you didn't know that your insurance company was gonna suck and not cover it. And so how much, how much am I willing to push for that and just completely make this person suffer is what it boils down to, right? Um, and how much I already had my attorney look at our agreement. He's like, this will hold up. It's not an issue, but it's more about that. How do, how do we, how do we walk that balance, hmm. right? Of once a homeowner thinks that Allstate or whoever pick a company is paying the fair amount and the greedy contractors thinks that they have to pay more. What, what are some things that we can do maybe before we sell the job? to avoid the situation altogether. But then now that we're in the situation, maybe some things that would help to kind of negotiate that out a little bit. Yeah. You're, I think you're, you're heading in the right spot when you just said before, before you sell the job. And that is where, that is where you lay the groundwork. That is where yeah. you educate your customer. And, and that educate, that education consists, includes telling the customer what the insurance company is going to do. Because you know exactly what this gonna, they're going to do. It's a script. So you're going to say, we're going we're gonna to do this job. First off, we're going to do the best job we can for you. We're going to dry your house out or whatever you guys, you guys are mainly mitigation, right? Yeah. You guys doing repairs. You guys doing uh, repairs? We do. Yeah, we do build back too. Okay. But at, on the front end, you know, let's assume you're doing mitt and then you're, you're flipping it into repairs. Um, we're going to take care of you. We're going to make sure your, your house is dried and safe. Uh, we're going to put together our invoice according to this schedule of fees that you, you know, we've agreeing to. If, there, if there's any, is there anything on this schedule of fees that you feel is unreasonable? And that, that language needs to be in that contract somewhere too. You know, I agree that this is reasonable. These are reasonable charges. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I expect to pay blah, blah, blah. I'm not an attorney, but you know, your, your guy can help you out. And then you tell them what the insurance company is going to do. You say, hey, we're going to send our invoice. You're going to send it. And you, you invoice your client. You never send anything directly to the insurance company. Ever, 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 ever. Because you're not an adjuster. And you're not licensed to do that sort of negotiating. And the insurance company and the insurance company adjuster is not your client. So... If they want to see your invoice, they can get it from their insured. So you give it to them and you say, hey, this is, I'm gonna give you our invoice. 
you're going to send it to your adjuster. Your adjuster is going to automatically say it's too much money. And what happens when the adjuster says it's too much money? Your client in the back of their mind says, oh, they already told me that. They already knew that. They, did, they told me this was going to happen before they even knew how much the job was going to be. Right? Because you just said the, the insured doesn't know how much it's going to be. Well, you don't either. That's why, we, that's why we have a schedule of fees. Otherwise, we'd be billing on a square foot basis and say, you know, we'll dry any house out for $15 a square foot, which I don't think is a bad idea. You know, some people need to go down that road. It just simplifies everything. Okay, you got a thousand square foot of affected area, $15. Your bill's going to be this. Here, I'll take a deposit today. Until we get to that point, none of you know how much is going to be until it's done. Yeah. So you do, you make sure that they know this is what, this is what's going to happen. And you tell your client, Hey, once we get into, you know, we'll give you a net 15 or net 30, whatever you guys decide on day 31, we're going to charge you 15% late fee or 10% late fee, whatever it is. And we're going to charge that every 30 days until we're paid in full on day, you know, look at your law, your lien laws. Also on day 62, we have, if we haven't been paid in full, we have to file a lien. You know, lien is not derogatory against your property. It, you know, once we are paid, we release the lien and there's no harm, no foul. But a lien and our late fees are our only tools we have to get collected, to get our money collected from these insurance companies who want to give us 50 cents on a dollar. Have that whole conversation up front. Yeah. People, people know, people are smart. And instinctively, people know the insurance company doesn't want to pay anything. Right. Um, and you also have to navigate that. Oh, what if they drop me? What if my rates go up? Blah, blah, blah. And you say, I can't control that. Right. You can control who you get insurance from. Maybe you need to start shopping if you don't like your experience, but you've chosen us to help you in your time of need and we're going to come through for you. And these are the things that we expect you to do for us in exchange. One, pay our bill. Two, advocate for yourself. And that's the biggest thing that we've done as an industry. We've taken the responsibility off of the clients. Yeah, that's true. And taken it on ourselves. But we don't have the tools. We are not the insured. We are not in their shoes unless you're doing AOB, which is a different story altogether. I'm, I'm a two minds of AOB uh, assignment benefits, if you don't know. Yeah, we don't have that in Texas, so it's not even a... I oh, I don't think you do, it. do you? Uh -huh. It's not, it's not legal, is it? No. So you're not in the position to tell the insurance company what they will and won't pay. Right. You're in the position of tell, telling your insured, your client, what cost they've incurred. And then so, once they get it in their mind that they've, I've incurred this cost, they tell the insurance company, hey, I've incurred this cost on this claim. That cost incurred is powerful language. Right, because they have to indemnify for all costs incurred, all reasonable costs incurred. Yeah. So when you're going through the statement of fees, like one of the things I'm thinking is you're going to get the, the question probably all the time is, well, is my insurance company going to pay this? Right. Well, you want, you know, $90 a, a unit for whatever. Um, I don't have any concept of this industry. And so, is Allstate going to pay this, mm -hmm. right? Well, I already know, no, Allstate's not, nobody's going to pay anything because they're going to look for any way to cut it anyways. Yep. Um, so what what have you seen work as far as helping to work through that kind of objection um, when they when they start asking about that? You go back to, to reasonable and customary. You go back to your history. I mean, you can go back how many years in, in your own <laughs> books and say, we've been charging these rates for these this amount of years. And every single one of these insurance companies has paid this. Some of them have paid quicker than others, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them we had to fight harder. But in the end, they all paid it. So if you have one job in the past that paid out 100% according to that schedule of fees, there's your answer. Yeah. Yes, they pay it. They don't want to pay it, but they will pay it. Right. And it's, and then you build that team between you and your customers say, between us, we're going to make sure that they're going to pay it. 
you know, you and I are going to work together to make sure this, this invoice gets paid and you don't come out of pocket for anything except your deductible because that's what you're owed. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a hard sell. I mean, we're not a hard sell. That's the wrong word. It's a, it's, it, it's, it's an involved mental process. Yeah, I mean, it's not as easy to say, hey, here's our authorization. Can we get started? And we'll send the invoice in, you know, and then, but you're just kind of putting off the problem. You got to deal with it at some point. So the reality is insurance companies know that they owe it. They just don't want right. to pay it. Uh, you guys understand what happens when reserves are set? A little bit. I'm not, I don't know a whole lot about it. So uh, quick, quick and dirty. Uh, premium dollars go in. Premium dollars are not part of an insurance company's general fund. They have to be held in reserve. Oh, oh there, there. there you guys. Okay, you start out a little bit. Uh, so they can't, your premium dollars you pay, they can't touch until the reserve is set. They set the reserves. Those premium dollars become claim dollars. They get put in the general fund and then the insurance company gets to play with it. And they want to play with it for as long as possible. That's why the claims department is a profit center, because if they take $100,000 in reserves for this claim, but they only pay out 75, guess what? They just made 25 grand. It's as easy as that. So no insurance company wants to pay anything. Uh, and you educate your customers on that. This is, this is how the game works. They don't want to give you your money that you're owed because they want to keep it in their own pocket. It's tough, but it's, it's the reality. So the more, the more time you spend educating and talking up front, the more likely you are to have an advocate on the back end. Yeah. No, I think that's true. That's something I've been seeing over the past couple of months is that if we handle it that way, I think it works out better. So, yeah. And so if you, if you talked about, uh, you, know, you signed up a job on March 1st and you talked about liens and late fees on Mark, March 1st. Now, here we are in May 21st and it should be no surprise. Hey, Miss, Miss Smith, the lien's going to be filed tomorrow. Uh, you might want to call your adjuster and you know, remind them that you're incurring late fees and you're about to have a lien on the property because they refuse to pay. They refuse to indemnify you. That's not a conversation you have. You do not call, you don't call the insurance company. You don't call the adjuster. I don't advocate that any contractor have a conversation with the claims department. You just don't. Make sure your invoice is tight. Make sure your work is solid. And then put that responsibility back where it belongs, which is the insured, the client. Um, there's, I know several guys. Are you guys in the, the Restoration Rebel Facebook group? Yeah. Yeah. We've got a lot of good information there. A lot of well, there's, so you need, you know, Tim Fuller, you know, uh, Steve, Steve Ardeno. Both those guys in the last couple of years have taken the tech. I don't talk to adjusters. They're not my client. I'm not licensed to talk to adjusters. My attorney recommends I don't talk to adjusters. So when that phone call and that email comes, their response is easy. They go yeah. back to their client, say, Hey, I can't, I can't have this conversation. If you feel we did anything wrong, let's talk about it. Let's address it. But until then, if, if not, my, my bill is due. And it take, you know, you get people yelling at you. You'll get, you know, hopefully not your clients, but you'll get adjusters calling and yelling at you. You will. Right. And your answer is, I can't talk to you. Click. That's it. And it becomes, it gets easier and easier. Your first couple. I mean, I remember the first couple I did. It was like, oh, my, my stomach was in knots. I, I'm not a good, I'm not good with conflict. I am, I am terrible. Um, I shouldn't be a public adjuster because I'm just bad with conflict. I can't handle it. It, it kills me. Um, but it gets easier and it gets, it takes the emotion out of it. Right. Because right now an adjuster calls you and says, I want to give you, I'm going to give, I'm our final offer offers 50 cents on a dollar. Well, that's your money right? That's your livelihood. That's your office and your payroll. That's your insurance that they're talking about. And that gets emotional. Yeah. And then you as an owner, just like, fuck you. And you start battling. Um, that's the first person to get mad loses. That's, 
That's what I like to say. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so get separate your personality out of it, separate the emotion out of it. This is a transaction. And as long as you guys know you did good work, we did good work, we took care of them, we went above and beyond, and we build according, we build them exactly how we told them we would. There's no supplement game, there's no gotchas, there's no hidden stuff, right? Um, oh, we didn't tell you about you know, whatever, we're gonna add project management on top, whatever. There's some people out there that that's the game they play. They go in, they play the supplement game, they go in and they take whatever the insurance company says. Okay, we'll give, we'll take 10 grand when we know it's worth 20. And then they supplement and sue on the back end. When they knew, if they knew it was 20 on the front end, they should have just said so. Yeah. Um, that's how I like to operate. You know, I just call a spade a spade. This job is a $20,000 job. And if you have someone come to you and say, hey, I've got ten thousand dollars to do this job. You know, travelers gave me ten grand. Uh, will you come do my work? And you know it's twenty. You say no, I can't. Now, what I can do is is build a proper estimate for you, and go get twenty. If you go get twenty for me, I'll start that job tomorrow. Um, but it's it's the mental ship shift of we are not responsible for that. Right. We're responsible for ourselves. We're responsible to make sure our crews look good on the job and they're clean and they brush their teeth that day. And, and, you know, they're not driving on the lawn. Yeah. He, he might need to brush his teeth. I don't know. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you this um, on a, on a situation where like going back to my one earlier where they're, you know, the invoice was 12,000. The adjuster says nine is, is the number because we don't pay these custom prices and, we don't pay on yeah. Tell me, tell me what the, what, what the pro, what the problems he had. So custom price list. Okay. Yeah. So in all, the only custom thing that I did was change the price of the air movers and DHUs, right. Okay. Well, on our monitoring charges. Um, they didn't like that. They didn't like, uh, Oh, the days of drying that just wanted 24 hour drying. And we said the day it hit, you know, the day it's on the property is the day it starts. And so, yeah. Because um, it's opportunity cost. Yeah. And so you there's that. And somewhere else making money. Yeah. yeah. And the O&P, right? And so, okay. so there's those three issues. Um, and the homeowner, you know, she's, she's old. She's broke. That's the story. Yeah. So is this a situation where like, and I've never used like a, an, a, a public adjuster or anything like that. Is this a situation where the homeowner using an appraisal could help recoup that difference? Or is I'm, it kind of too late for that? More, I'm seeing more and more appraisal on MIT than I ever have before. Mm -hmm. And it, it's silly to me because how are you supposed to appraise a service that unless you were there on day one and, and, and unless you were there every day, how am I as an appraiser supposed to know how long that, how that job should have taken? You know, so when I when I see appraisals on mitigation, that's just his best guess and his opinion of what it should take in. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, your your high your your moisture readings and your dry logs tell you how long that job takes. You know, right. In, in well, I mean, more to help cover the like the equipment pricing that they don't want to pay for, and you need and to, the O and P kind yeah, of those develop, items. Develop a script develop a script and in a boilerplate response. Uh, your response to the, to the pricing on the air movers and dehues is we, pr we price our equipment according to our overhead and, you know, our, our needs. We price our equipment according to our needs, not what Xactimate feels it should. You know, sure. we are, we're a contractor in the state of Texas. We're allowed to charge uh, what we charge. And so we let you know up front, that's, uh, this is our fees before they even signed. This is yeah. our fees. We're going to charge you $35 a day for a D, uh, for an air mover. They knew up front. Right. Yeah. So moving forward, definitely. But on the back end, now that I've got some that we didn't do that, can you see any workaround to where there's something we can do to help? Well, you explain it. You, some of that. You, you, you still do the explaining. You, you, you put together a nice letter yeah. and say, and you go point by point. You don't like what I'm charging for, for air movers. What I've, what I've said in the past in my letters is 
if Travelers Insurance has a na national uh, national schedule of fees that they require everyone to follow, where was that in the insurance policy? And can I get a copy of it? You ask them for a copy of their schedule of fees. They don't have it and they can't provide it. Yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll stump them. Overhead and profit, uh, especially in Texas. You know, there's all kinds of Texas state law that says contractors can charge overhead and profit. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing in that law that says if you do mitigation work, you can't charge OMP. Or if you do roofing work, you can't charge OMP. Show me that policy language. Show me that legislation. In the absence of those two things, I'm going to charge overhead and profit commensurate with my overhead and profit considerations as a business. But you've got to spell it out. That's my reason. Why'd you charge OMP? Because I need it to stay in business. And you, you spell it out there. And then days of drying, you go back to your dry logs. Hey, the equipment was set here. It wasn't dry till here. The equipment was on site and running because I confirmed it because I checked it every day. That's why documentation is so key on MIT. Sure. You can say you sent a guy there every single day. You measured the moisture in that stud wall or that drywall or whatever else every single day. On day 15, it finally came dry. I can't control physics. I can't control the weather. I can control what I do with my equipment and my manpower. And that's what I did. So 15 days is the time. If you can show me anywhere in that 15 days where I was drying something unnecessarily that was already dry, we can talk about that and have some flexibility. Because sometimes you'll have 20 pieces of equipment, but some of that four pieces of that equipment is in a room that actually came dry. And right. you just left it there because you didn't want to go back, right? Sure. Well, okay. Okay, that room did come dry after four days. I'll take those four pieces of equipment off. Show some flexibility. I mean, we're not, we're, it's not set in stone and you do have some flexibility, right? We, let's be real. We know there's, there's a little bit of wiggle room in everything we do. Yeah. So, so show some reasonability for it. But just taking four days because someone says that's what it should have taken. They need to come with a little bit more than that. They need to come with data. Okay, show me the data that you took on day six that shows that place. Yeah, right. all, all they show is, well, we ran the calculations, you know, in our software, and that's what it says. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's yeah. what it says, yeah. Yeah, and do you run your business according to their calculations, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and if Traveler's Insurance has a drying guide calculator that they require their vendors or their insureds to use when they're drying out their properties, I'd love to see it. We will consider it if you show it to us. That's it. I mean, it's, it feels a little facetious. Yeah. And it is a little bit, but the reality is they're throwing bullshit at you. So I'm going to throw bullshit right back. All right. Show me the policy language. Show me your pricing guide. You know, show me your national pricing guide. Uh, and that goes with not just OMP and, and air movers and days of drying. That goes to, I had a large loss where a guy, it was, oh, 30 days. It was a 30 day cleanup. It was a fire. So they had drying and then they had cleaning, uh, smoke mitigation. And they were there for 30 days and it was a big job. So they got a job trailer. And their consultant, I think it was a Sedgwick consultant or maybe it was held, JS held. JS Held came in and said, well, you didn't need a job trailer. It doesn't matter. You weren't there on day one. You weren't even there, there on day 30. You're, there, you're here on day 80 trying to tell me what I should and shouldn't have used on my own job. The reality is it was there. We used it and I'm billing for it. Um, but that conversation can't handle, or, uh, that can't, conversation cannot happen with just you and the JS Held guy or you and the adjuster. Your client has to be in the middle. None of these conversations happen without your client there. Because mm -hmm. once that, once you start having conversations without the client involved and there and present, even sending an email, you never send an email without your client CC'd on it, right? 
I would prefer you not send any emails at all and have your client do it. But if you do that without with not being in the presence of your client, you are public adjusting. Even if it's about our own invoice. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I am licensed as a public adjuster in Oregon because that's illegal. Doing that act is illegal. I got called to the state. The state called me down. It was years ago, 2013. And I said, well, I'll, they said, we'd like to have a conversation about your business. And at the time I was just doing consulting. I was just, I was writing estimates for contractors and I was helping out homeowners just by writing estimates. So I went down to Salem. <laughs> they led me into a door or into a room with no windows, locked the door behind me. I'm like, oh shit, what's going on here? I had no idea. Two late, two gals, one of them pushes a badge across the table. The other one pushes a tape recorder across the table and hits record. Let's talk about what you're doing, Mr. McCabe. I mean, what I was doing was, was just consulting, right? Just writing estimates. And I explained the whole process and I wrote it out. I said, yeah, there's, there's the insurance company, the insured and the contractor. And, you know, after a while, the insured kind of drops off and the contractor and the adjuster start having conversations about grades of cabinets, quality of flooring, blah, blah, blah. And, and one of the ladies says, and she, I drew this out, this triangle on a piece of paper. And she pointed to that, that the, the spot between those two circles, the, the contractor and the adjuster. And she said, where's the homeowner when these conversations are happening? And I said, well, homeowners don't want to get involved in that stuff. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to be bothered with it. Um, so usually the contractor just takes on the responsibility of doing these negotiations. And, and she said, so the, the homeowner is not present. I said, no, not usually. And she said, that's exactly where you're breaking the law. That is, you are in violation of the state statute when you have a conversation or a negotiation with an insurance company outside of the presence of your client. And she gave me three options. She said, you can keep doing what you're doing and we will investigate you fully and we will file injunctions today. You can stop what you're doing and find some other way to make money. Right? That was not a good option. Neither one is a good option for me. Third, well, I'll give you 30 days to go get your PA's license. This will be a non <coughs> So what did I do? I got my PA's license. I had no intention to be a public adjuster. I wanted to continue doing, helping people in the way I knew how, because I know exactly so well. So I took option three. And, and, you know, that was seven, eight years ago. And now I'm a public adjuster. I'm licensed in several states because I want to be able to have those conversations right. without violating the law. All right. You guys, there's nothing, you didn't sign up to be professional negotiators. Yeah. You didn't sign be. up to be claims adjusters. You, you, you really didn't sign up to, to do this stupid thing called Xactimate. You just wanted to dry out houses and help people, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get back to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Your contracts, your schedule fees, and your mentality will help you get there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. That's good. So, I mean, back to the question. Yeah. With the appraisal then, do you see any, any likelihood of, of being able to get paid on some of that stuff on stuff that's already done that we didn't get, you know, talk about schedule of fees and everything. Is that a viable option that, you know, homeowner lady can can go to, to try to get that $3,000? Yeah. Appraisal is an option. It's going to cost her money though. Yeah. Cause she's got to pay her appraiser. What, then what, what other options do you think there are? I mean, you know, I guess she's, we could. Yeah. She could sue. Yeah. Uh, but she could sue the insurance company and she could sue you if she feels, you know, right. I, sure. There's, there's, there, there's very few great options and that's why the insurance company does what they do. Yeah. They know they hold a lot of the cards and the only ones you hold, the only one you really do hold is the lien. Um, especially when that work's done. They know you've incurred that cost. They know you're in pain. Um, I had a, a, a good client of mine call me last Friday and he said, he did, it was a, we worked up his invoice for him. It was $525,000. And so he's got costs of over 200 into this thing. 
It's a is an old folks home. I think it was in it was in Texas. I forget where it was. Anyway, major loss in an old folks home, a, a, a care facility. He hadn't been paid a dime, and he was out, you know, two hundred grand in expenses, and he was feeling it. He was like, "Man, they want to give me, they want to give me two seventy. Should I take it?" And I, I couldn't tell him yes or no. I said, "Man, that hurts. It really hurts." Uh, think about the precedent you're going to set in your market if you take 275. You take 275, you break even, right? And and you get out of it. Whew, you know, at least I didn't lose my ass. Well, the next big one, what's going to happen? They're going to screw you again. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the best thing to do is not get in that situation. Uh, yeah. After you're in that situation, your AR is is out of control. That's not an answer I can give you. It's really hard and it's case by case. Yeah. You know, if you want to just clear out the AR, you know how to do that. Take 50 cents on the dollar mm-hmm. um, and set that precedent with every adjuster you're working with. That's what it will do. We're willing to do that. Because then the next one you try to fight on, you're like, well, wait a minute, Miss Smith, you took 50 cents on the dollar. Yeah. Miss Smith, you, you agree to go three day drying. You know, Miss Smith, you, 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 blah, 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 everything else. So do they keep here. records of all the companies they're dealing with for a long time? You think? I don't think so. Yeah. I really don't. I think there's so much turnover on the, on the carrier side, especially on the TPA level uh, and the adjuster, the desk adjuster level, those guys don't last. Um, I thought for a long time that I was being blacklisted in a major way. You know, I got, I got fired from, uh, from a major company in California. I won't even say him, uh, because, you know, shortly after the vice president of claims for nationwide insurance called the president of the company, um, said, we don't like the fact you hired Andy McCabe. Uh, and I was gone within four days. Um, so I, at that point I thought, oh, man, I'm blacklisted. I don't think that's common. You know, I think that's more of a fact that I'm so vocal and so out there on, on social media. Uh, that I may have a target on my back, but localized, you know, you guys, you might, you might be blacklisted in somebody's mind, but they're not going to be there for more than a couple of years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know if they just had like formal records that they keep, or I don't know that they would. That would be a very dangerous list. I think for anyone to put on paper, Uh, Mm -hmm. because then that, that list gets out. Oh my God. Uh, There was, you know, 2014, Four, I think 14 is when the Restoration Rebels came out with their national list. We had a map. We had a Google map overlay of all the rebels across the country. That map was up for seven hours before I started getting phone calls from, from members saying, hey, take me off. Take me off. Get me off the map. Travelers just called me and said they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna kick me off the programs. Farmers just called me and said they're going to kick me off the programs. Wow. So while there's no official blacklist, they don't want anyone out there that that doesn't toe the company line. Yeah, they do not like. I mean, you just go into my feed in on LinkedIn, you will see some hate. You will see some shade <laughs> from from the carrier side, uh, and that's fine. That's that's why I. That's largely why I do what I do because folks like you guys can't afford to do that. You can't you can't afford to be that vocal and that that kind of aggressive, right? You've got to play nice in the sandbox where I get to, I, you know, I'm not you, I, I don't represent you. I can represent the entire industry and say, fuck you. This is, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is what needs to change. And that's a big part of why I'm doing this is I want to, I want to empower folks like you to, to, <laughs> to realize that you don't have to play by arbitrary rules. They were made by someone who doesn't have your best interest in mind. Right. Yeah. That's how many true. guys you got? How many, how many crews you got? Um, so we sub out all of our demo. Um, yeah. We were running what? Seven crews, I think five, six guys a piece. And then um, we just had one technician for about two months working with us. And then we let him go and kind of did everything else on our own. So, okay. But uh, how long you guys kinda, been doing that? How long have you been in business? So as a company, 20 years, um, okay. doing mitigation, 10, 
10, 11. I, I've been doing it for, I've been doing mitigation for since 2005. Okay. Um, and then we partnered up in 2013. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's us. So yeah, we're, we, we do enough to provide for the families and have a little bit of money left over at the end of the year, you know, but uh, always looking to streamline it, make it better and get rid of some of the frustration that we found this time around. What uh, do you guys, what kind of system, what do you have, what system do you have in place for mitigation documentation? So as far as documentation goes, we run all our, our projects through Acculinks um, as the software. Yeah. Acculinks. Acculinks. So it's geared, we do roofing too. So it's kind of geared to the roofing side of things, but it's just okay. the customer manager. It's a CRM. Okay. Yeah, it's the CRM. So all our emails go through that. We can, we use company cam for our photos. Okay. We yep. use, yep. We use your 24 hour tech system. Ah, that's the right answer. I like but it. I've, I've modified it and added some of our own stuff to it. So we yep. kind of had a hybrid, hybrid of that. And we're also not real consistent in the stuff that we do, right? We'll, we'll do yeah. something really good for a couple of jobs. And then it's like, Hey, we want to change it. So when we try something else and then that's just kind of our MO, we're not real good about sticking with something that works, you know, yeah. But, yeah, simplify simplify yeah. simplify simplify that's that's where the 24-hour tech came from yeah is you know i was hiring a new guy i was hiring and training a new technician every month because they were just burning out you know i wasn't in charge of of what they got paid and <laughs> i wasn't in charge of how much they worked and we worked a lot because we he was doing program work in scottsdale uh but i needed a way just to boil it down. These are the, these are the simple things. These are the only things you have to do on every single claim uh, in order to be successful. And everything outside that was, was style points and, and fluff and what it ended up being is a distraction. So if you can get your guys tunnel vision on their task and not worry about anything else, they can move a whole lot faster and a whole lot more efficient. Um, so you guys are awesome. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, no, thanks for the time. Thanks for your, your insight. That's got a lot of good things we're going to start uh, implementing. I think it'll help. So good. Uh, in circle is not a bad uh, thing to look at. Uh, they've got a mitigate, they've got a mitigation documentation module in their software. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Okay. Uh, better than something like dry track or something like that, or mica which are just garbage. And I'm not afraid to say so publicly um, because they were made by the insurance company in order to, to cut drying times essentially. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it, it helps to have, I like you're using company cam. Um, what's the other, there's another software just came out. They have an integration with Xactimate, Job Nimbus. Yeah, I haven't so, looked into that. So Job Nimbus is a CRM and a documentation and a file kind of, yeah, if, if you put, I've got a client that uses Job Nimbus for everything. And when things go legal and he has to go to an attorney, he just clicks a button and pff, the whole file is organized and all the notes, blah, 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 and it's just packaged. It's nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Job Nimbus is another one. I think they interact with company can pretty well. Um, but that's, that's as far as I know from now. So, cool. Hey, looking forward to seeing you guys in the groups. Um, are we hooked up on LinkedIn yet? I don't think so. I, I did see your profile. I don't know. It popped up on my feed, but I don't think we're connected on that. So. Okay. Well, hit me up. Let's get connected. Yeah. Uh, and if there's anything at all I can do for you, you got my email. Cool, man. Appreciate your time. Great to see you guys. We'll all see right, you. Thanks. Thank you.